Shalom. We're to Shia Life Ministries, sound wisdom for a successful walk. We proclaim the gospel of the kingdom as we take the light of the word to the world to edify, equip, and empower the disciples of Yeshua, our Messiah. I want to thank you for this opportunity to share and serve the word of God to you, the instruction, direction, and wisdom of Yahweh, our God and our Father in heaven, teaching others righteousness and holiness so they can live a holy and fruitful life. That is the target. That is the goal. We ask, Father, guide our steps as we seek your kingdom first according to the yoke of Yeshua, your son. Amen. Just a reminder that Tashia Life Ministries teaches the Bible within its biblical context. We do not follow the practices of Judaism, Hebrew Israelites, or sacred names, or any Hebrew roots movements as that were. There are many similarities because we're using the same book and learning about the same cultural precepts that we're supposed to follow. But we are separate and distinct from many of those particular groups. And I just think it's important that you're aware of that. Now, let's get into this word. Yeshua never had his own synagogue, his own meeting place, except occasionally for his home, his own home. Yet for about three years, he taught in synagogues, open spaces, and the temple in Jerusalem. He proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom of heaven, and he made disciples. It says that he went around doing these things and healing those who were oppressed by the devil. Well, the focus of Tushia Life Ministries is to make disciples of Yeshua the Messiah and to edify, equip, and empower them to do the same thing that Yeshua did. In order to be a disciple, though, you need to have a proper frame of reference. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, Yeshua told the 11 disciples who went to Galilee to see him after his resurrection. He said, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to keep all the things that I've commanded you. And behold, I am always with you, even to the end of the age. His syllabus was pretty simple. Make disciples baptize those disciples, teach those disciples his commands. That was it. That's what they were supposed to do. I was taught that a disciple was a learner. And that seemed simple enough, but I've since come to understand that a disciple in Greek, that is mathetes, describes a person who learns from another by instruction, inquiry, and observation whether formal or informal. And they are an adherent, that is, one who strongly supports a particular person, principle, or a set of ideas of their teacher. The word disciple itself really has no spiritual significance. It's a term that was pulled out of the Greek context just as a word to use when it was being translated. Because, you see, I've come to understand that Yeshua would not call would not call his followers um, Mathetes, which is Greek. He would call them Talmudim. Talmudim. That is the Hebrew term. So when I use the word disciple biblically, I'm referring to a Talmudim. And the reason I'm making that distinction is because a Talmudim's deepest desire was to follow their rabbi, their teacher, so closely that they would start to think and act just like them. So when you saw their rabbi or teacher and you looked at them, you could tell they were associated with this particular person. Why? Because of the way that they carried about their mannerisms and their thought processes. In Acts chapter 11, verse 26, the last part of the verse reads, And the disciples were called Christians in Antioch. This is because they thought and they acted like Yeshua. 
Now notice, it doesn't read the Christians became disciples. No, no, not at all. Paul captures how they thought and acted in the book of Acts chapter 24, verse 14, where Paul says, I confess to you that according to the way, which they call a sect or denomination, I do serve the God of our fathers, believing everything that's in accordance with the law, which is the Torah, and that is written in the prophets. Paul makes it clear how to identify a disciple. A disciple follows the way, that is referring to Yeshua's teachings, his, that was the way. They serve the same God as the fathers, their ancestors, which, was, which would have been Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they believe everything that's written in the Torah, that is the, 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 it's called the law of Moses, or better, what Yahweh told Moses to give to his people that Yeshua took and continued to pass on, and what's written in the prophets. If a person calls themselves a disciple or Christian like those in Acts 11.26, you have to ask the question, do they follow the way? or another way. Often at the end of many Christian services, the pastor or other uh, person will invite people who don't know Christ to repeat a, a 15 second prayer. Afterwards, they'll say, we declare that you're a born again Christian. Well, a really good question would be, did that person just make a profession, profession of faith? based on a clear, accurate, relevant, and edifying understanding of who Yeshua is and who his father is and what his instructions are? Or are they making a profession of feelings based on a soul-stirring message? While it's true, Yahweh's spirit can, call, can use a, a soul-stirring message to draw a person to Christ, that person needs to be clear on what they are choosing to believe and why. Don't get caught up in the emotion of it because when the emotions go down, reality will strike. Yeshua told those who wanted to follow him in Luke 14, beginning at the 28th verse, don't begin until you count the cost. Don't start following me until you count the cost. Find out what's involved in that. Don't just look at all the good and all the happy things that you think are going to happen because that's only a part of the reality. There's another portion. It says, don't begin until you count the cost. For who would consider or who would begin constructing a building without first counting the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might only complete the foundation before running out of money. And everyone would laugh at you. That's right. They would say, he started building, but couldn't finish. Or, what king would go to war, <clears throat> pardon me, without first sitting down with his counselors, see, not just by himself, but trying to get wise counsel to discuss if his army of 10,000 soldiers could defeat the army of 20,000 soldiers marching against him. And if not, a delegation would be sent out to discuss terms of peace while the enemy was still far away from them. You're about to build a new life and it's going to cost something to build. You need to know that if you're going to be a disciple of Yeshua. You're about to enter spiritual warfare and you need to realize that you're on a battleground and not a playground. Why, why are we saying all this? Because you need to count the cost of what it means to follow Yeshua and be one of his disciples. He also tells those who, uh, who want to follow him in Matthew chapter 11, verse 29 and 30. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The yoke he's referring to is the way he teaches scriptures. That's what the word yoke means in this context, the way a teacher presents their message or their lessons. And to understand how Yeshua teaches the scripture, we have to understand his frame of reference. 
We get this frame of reference from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, beginning at verse 17, where we read, Don't think, Yeshua speaking, don't think I've come to do away with the law of Moses or the prophets. I haven't come to do away with them, but to fulfill them, meaning to establish, explain, and exemplify them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law of Moses until everything is accomplished. Anyone, anyone who breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness is greater than the Pharisees and teachers of the Torah, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Do you hear that? If your righteousness is not higher, greater, or more impacting than that of the Pharisees, you will not even enter the kingdom of heaven? Well then, how can my righteousness surpass the Pharisees? by preserving, protecting, and practicing the doctrines of Scripture over the dogmas of scholars. Mark's Gospel, chapter 7, shows us what this looks like. Mark 7, beginning at the seventh verse. So, the Pharisees and teachers of the Torah asked Yeshua, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with unclean hands? Yeshua told them, (laughs) You've let go of God's commands to keep the tradition of men. And he said, You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to keep your own traditions. And then he gives them an example. Moses said, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his mother or father, whatever help financially I was going to give to you, it's korban, which means it's a gift given to God. Then you, Pharisees, no longer let that person do anything for their father or mother. When you do this, You render null and void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down one after the other. And you do many things like that. Many things like that. The commands of God given through Moses are scriptural doctrine. A lot of times we toss the word doctrine around, or which means teachings, but the commands of God through Moses that Yeshua taught are scriptural doctrine. Instructions on how to follow the way. That's right. The traditions of the elders or the traditions of men are are scholarly dogmas. Man-made instructions often elevated to equal or exceed the authority of God's word. Well, Yeshua only operated based on what his father said. Listen to what he tells the people. In John chapter 5, verse 19, Yeshua gave them this answer. I tell you the truth. The son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees the father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. Yeshua expects us, those who follow him as, as his disciples, to get the bulk of our instruction from the scriptures. No, he doesn't want us just sitting around on a, on a rock somewhere about by a lake just waiting for the Spirit of God to descend upon my mind and give me a revelation. No, he says open up the book and get the information, some instruction and some inspiration that way. As a disciple of Yeshua, I should know what the Bible is. I should know how we got this Bible and that I can trust it. You see... The Bible, yeah, I'll use this. The Bible 
is a credible document. It's not just we just believe in it and that gives it its truth or its strength or what have you. No, uh, if we didn't believe in it, the Bible is still true. It's a credible document, document which reveals who, who created the, and filled the heavens and the earth and reveals his purpose, his plan, and his provision for all of humanity on this earth. His name means he exists and we call him Yahweh our God. Yahweh means he exists. So every time you say Yahweh, you're saying he exists. He exists. Does God exist? Yahweh. He exists. The Bible is not one book. A lot of times we say it's just one book. It's not. It's a library of 66 books that were written over a period of about 1,500 years initially written in the Hebrew language to the Hebrew people living in a, in a nomadic Hebrew culture. And over time, the narratives, the historical accounts, and the teachings were translated from Hebrew and some Aramaic into Greek and then into Latin and then later into German and then into European English. I say European English because we speak American English which means if you use, let's say, a King James Bible, that uses the Queen's or the King's English from England. And they use terms back then that we don't use now. We use a dialect of the English language, which is known as American English. There is a Bible called the ASV, the American Standard Version of 1901, was a revision of the King James English-speaking Bible for the ASV is for American speakers. Now, 39 books of those 66 books were used in Yeshua's day. That's right. They were already set before the last prophet Malachi spoke. The remaining 27 books or letters, if you will, were written during that first century that Yeshua lived and died and rose again. So all of these books were written by the close of the first century AD. Now there are two arguments about the Bible you should be aware of as a, as a disciple. Because you see in 1 Peter 3.15, we're told that we're supposed to be ready to give a response to anyone who asks us a reason for the hope that's in us. Well, that means you need to know what you believe, you need to know why you believe it, and you need to be able to say what source you're using to get that information. If you're unclear about those things, then how can you say you're confident in what you're doing? No, you may not know that in the first 30 days, maybe six months or so, but this is something that you should be growing in that you can speak about confidently. Now, I said two arguments about the Bible you need to be aware of. Some people refer to this as apologetics. I just refer to it as knowing what you believe and why. They say that, you know what? There are some books that are missing from the Bible. How, how can we know that we have all of them? I believe we can rest assured that we have all the books. There are no missing books from the collection of the 66 that we have. Now, there were some books that were added after the 39 Hebrew texts were already in a book. They were referred to as the Torah, the prophets, and the writings, also called the Tanakh, for those three sections. They were already set by the time Yeshua's day had come along. And during that time, before Yeshua came on the scene, and after the Hebrew scriptures had already been written, there were some other books people started adding in, roughly two to three hundred years before Christ came on the scene. Well, as time progressed, there were some people who said, those, those books don't belong with the other scriptures. They're not a part of the Hebrew scriptures, and they're not a part of what we call the New Testament writings. So some people said they should not be added in, and they've taken those books that should never have been added in out. So those books aren't missing. They may have some historical reference and importance and support and help can be helpful, but they don't carry the weight that scripture does have of those 66. Second, we don't know who wrote most of the books. People say, you don't even know who wrote those books. That's true for many of the books. Many of them, we do know exactly who wrote them, but for some, we don't. But you know what? I believe what matters most is if the content in that book 
is factual, accurate, and relevant. If that if the if the information is good, who wrote it? I'm glad you wrote it down so you could pass it on. Because of this, we can trust the Bible. It's a historical document worthy of our trust. We can reference the experiences of the Hebrew people when they preserved, protected, and practiced the instructions, directions, and wisdom in the scriptures. They were able to get the blessing and the benefits that came along with that. However, when they resisted, when they rejected, when they rebelled against all of that, well, they experienced the negative consequences, judgments, and curses that were a result of that. Many things recorded in scripture about people, places, or events are often found to be true through archeological findings. That's right, every so many years, they're telling us more and more of the things that they find that scripture has already spoken about. And by the way, these findings don't confirm the scripture's truthfulness. The scripture is already true. The archeological findings are just finding this out as well. If you want to be a disciple of Yeshua, you have to want to think and act like he did. No, no, I don't mean wearing sandals and, and, a, and a tunic and things like that, but the principles and the practices of the word and the way that he followed it. You have to think and act like him, which means you want to listen for the Father's voice, see what the Father is doing as you read scripture so that you can do what the Father wants you to do. You have to adopt Yeshua's frame of reference and adapt to his way of teaching. Remember, his focus was on scriptural doctrine and not scholarly dogma. And you have to develop a growing familiarity with the Bible. Memorization is not a bad thing. It is a good thing, but maybe you can't memorize a lot. That's okay. Read passages of scripture, read books of the Bible, read about people in the Bible and get to know their story. And as you get to know their story, you'll begin to see they're a lot more like you than some, some uh, created person that you find in a movie, the, pro, the protagonist of the movie. No, they're, they're people whom God called and said, I want your story in my book. Don't worry now. He's got a book with your name in it too. It's just not in the 66 that we have here, but he's writing down everything that you and I do. He's keeping track of all of our works and our deeds. And one day he's gonna say, let me take a look at all that they've done. And on that day, you're gonna to wanna to hope that you have more things that have been built based on gold and silver and precious stone uh, of good things as opposed to wood, hay, and stubble. It's not gonna mean whether you go to the kingdom or not go to the kingdom, but it will have an impact on what you do in the kingdom. So, so, are you a disciple that some people would look and say, oh, there's a Christian because they think and act like Yeshua of Nazareth, the Messiah and the Son of God? Or are you a Christian because you said a quick prayer and someone told you that you've been born again, but you're just wandering around almost thinking and living like people in the world and you need to become a disciple. The father and the son already know the answer. The question is, can those around you, as they look at you, tell you tell which one you are? Think about it, because we're gonna continue in this vein, learning more about what it costs to become a disciple. Shalom. Well, hi there. We're back at the near the close of our service today, and it's time for the blessing. We want to thank you for being a part of today's service. Glad you are here and hope to see you again next week. But now I want to bless you and those in your household. Yahweh bless you and protect you. Yahweh make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. Yahweh look upon you with favor and give you Shalom.
We look forward to seeing you next week at 10.30 a.m. because that's the time that we meet on Saturdays. And until then, please continue to seek first the kingdom of God, our Father, and his righteousness, and all those things that we have need of, he promises to add them to us in his timing and in his way, but he promises to ensure we have everything we need to accomplish his will here on earth so that the things that we do will be like those things that are done in heaven. Until next time, Shalom Aleichem.